So this week we'll be talking about grounded theory and participant observation. So this is a little comic that I really like. Um, it says, I love our, our lunches out here, but I always get the feeling we're being watched and they're having lunch in front of the sociology department. And forgive my voice this week, I've been sick, so I'm going to sound a little bit breathy, so I hope there's no volume problems. But so this week when we talk about grounded theory and participant observation, this is what a lot, a lot, a lot of sociologists do. So I first wanted to lay out the types of research, just so you're clear where we've been in the semester and where we're going to be in the semester. So the types of quantitative research that we've worked with are statistical modeling and secondary data analysis. The secondary data analysis came with using the GSS for your quantitative papers. And so that's a data set that's already been collected. And so it's secondary because you're analyzing it now and it's already been analyzed by other people. And the other thing, statistical modeling, was just those charts and graphs that you made for me for the bivariate analysis. And there are other types of quantitative research, but these two are the most well-known ones and they're often connected. And then in terms of types of qualitative research, there's things like participant observation, and don't worry if you don't know what these things are yet, I will explain them as we go along today. But there are things like participant observation, there's things like ethnography, sometimes also called field work, there's things like interviews, focus groups, and there's a bunch of other different types as well, and there's also mixed methods, um, approaches like con content analysis, for example. So it depends on how you do it. Many of these can be done as mixed methods and you'll often combine methods. So for example, you might do some statistical modeling and then also do some ethnography. So you can mix these methods as well. But so this week and for the rest of the semester or for the rest of the um, session, we'll be talking about primarily qualitative research. And there's also something called participatory action research, and this is shortened to PAR. We're not going to talk about this one too much, um, or the focus groups. We'll focus mostly on participant observation, ethnography and fieldwork, and interviews. But so these are just other types to be aware of. So basics in qualitative research, participant observation, what I mean by this is that it originated with anthropology, so it's a fairly old um, method. And it's done to gain familiarity with a particular group of individuals. So often um, people will go out into the field and participate in what they're observing. So that's where participant observation comes from. So for example, my mentor, Jonathan Wynn, um, in this department at UMass, did a study about tour guides where he would go on tours, and tour guides of New York City particularly, and he would go on tours and look at how stories were constructed with this group of people who were not affiliated with each other, but how these people interacted with other people. So, and we'll talk more about specific um, examples as well, more famous examples. So then we come to ethnography. So ethnography is a particular type of participant observation, and it's often difficult to draw lines between what is ethnography and what is participant observation. But as a general rule, ethnography is more culture-focused, whereas participant observation is more individual-focused. That doesn't mean that participant observation can't deal with culture or that ethnography can't deal with individuals, but that that's the general uh, distinction that most people draw between those approaches. And so another type is interviews, qualitative research. And these are usually semi-structured, so that means that you have a set of questions, but that doesn't mean you go through them by rote memorization. It means that you ask them, and then your respondent tells you something, and then you say, oh, that's really interesting, so let's go with that. And then you pick up another thread, maybe, that you didn't expect. So interviews are often used to fill out things like ethnography or participant observation as well. So it's basically a way to get more data, and it's more one-on-one -on -one data. And these are often, as I said, used as a complement to field work. And this last thing is focus groups. And this is basically a group of participants sharing opinions. So it's kind of like you can think of it as a group interview. And like I said, we won't talk much about focus groups, but I did want to mention them. So grounded theory, this is the other big thing this week. And you've I used this in the title of this lecture so you're probably kind of wondering, what is grounded theory? So grounded theory is this specific methodology developed by Glazer and Strauss in 1967, and they wanted to develop something for the purposes of building theory from data. So notice that methodology is different from method, and I just want to draw those two apart a little bit. So methodology is a way of thinking about and studying social phenomena, whereas a method is the technique 
or procedure for gathering and analyzing that data. So your methodology is kind of like the basis for your method. How you think about and study social phenomena leads you to pick the technique that you use to gather and analyze that data. <clears throat> and so grounded theory is inductive, not deductive. So what we've been doing up to this point is deductive. And what I mean by that is that inductive is where you have data and then you identify patterns or relationships within that data and then you build theory and analysis. So what we've been doing is saying, let's have some theories, let's look at the data, and then let's, you know, connect those two, basically. So grounded theory is very much inductive. You have the data, and then you build your theories. You don't go into the field having theories already built. I mean, obviously, we all come with preconceived notions into our work as sociologists, but in general, you try really hard not to have these ideas about what you're going to find or how it's going to be. So that's what grounded theory is. And a little bit more about it, it basically lets the data speak for itself. And because you don't often know what you're looking for, you often have a lot more data than if you were using non-grounded theory approach. So because you don't know what you're looking for, right, you take notes on everything. You take um, data down about everything. You notice everything. That's the idea with grounded theory. So you'll often have a lot more data to wade through, but that can also lead to much richer projects. Whereas if you're collecting data for a preconceived theory or um, uh, a thing that you're testing, then it can be much less rich because you already are looking for only that and you're not looking for other things. And there's a Sherlock Holmes quote that's particularly appropriate for grounded theory. And Sherlock Holmes, this fictional detective character, said, It is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. So this is how you should think about grounded theory, is that you are using the data to make theories. You should be twisting your theories to suit the data, not twisting the, the facts or the, the data to suit your theories. So that's a really good way to think about grounded theory. Some common concerns about grounded theory. One is, what if the data doesn't suit your interests? What do you do? Well, you either design another way of collecting data, or you change your interests. Obviously, there are other approaches, but in general, if the data doesn't suit your interests, you have to either collect more or you change your interests. So that's the case for both grounded and non-grounded theory. It just matters a little bit more with grounded theory because obviously if you're looking to talk about immigration and all your subjects want to talk about is, I don't know, cooking, then obviously you're going to have to either change your interests or design another way of collecting data. But those are things to think about. And the other question is, how can you find something if you don't know what you're looking for? So the interesting thing is that you have to be creative and open to unexpected results. So remember what we talked about in, I think, the first unit, that um, there should always be the, the element of surprise in social research or the possibility for surprise. So this is very much in line with that. And there's always something to find is the other thing. It's just a matter of framing it correctly or it's a matter of looking at it differently. So if I tell you that your question maybe is not sociological or your topic is not sociological... Um, teachers say this a lot. I've heard it a lot myself, and you will hear it in your course of being a sociologist, I suspect. But if they say you're not, it's not sociological, look at it a different way. Always be looking for new ways to look at your data. Be looking for new ways to think about your data. That's really important as a social scientist. And that's true, I think, whether you're quantitative or qualitative or mixed methods. So participant observation versus ethnography, these are a little bit, like I said, difficult to um, tease out from one another because they're very much similar and they're very much related to each other. But so I wanted to give you two examples that are fairly um, famous and somewhat recent in the field. So for participant observation, um, Ashley Mears, who is a sociologist, I believe at Boston University, she's definitely somewhere around this area, um, relatively speaking, somewhere around this area. So she wrote this book called Pricing Beauty, The Making of a Fashion Model. And she was working as a fashion model at the time of writing this book. So she wanted to talk about what it's like to be a model, why this industry is so different from other industries in that women make more money than men in the fashion industry as models. 
And so she wanted to talk about that and how this gets constructed as a field of work. So she was participating because she was working as a model, but she was also observing. She was always taking notes. She was always thinking about things. She was always drawing connections between her data. So that's a really um, contemporary example. I think her book came out like last year or the year before. And so another example of ethnography, and this is a somewhat classic example, is Mitch Dunye's Sidewalk. And he is also, I believe, semi-local. He's either in New York or um, Massachusetts, if I recall correctly. But so he wrote this book called Sidewalk, and he was talking about um, the culture of street vendors in New York City. And he was looking very closely at this culture that he knew nothing about beforehand. He basically just walked by some street vendors one day and was like, hey, that looks really interesting. I wonder what that, you know, I wonder what that's like. And so he started talking to these street vendors and he built rapport with them. And actually one of the street vendors um, often does lectures with him as well to talk about their book. And they call it very much their book. So the other interesting thing about qualitative research, and particularly about ethnographic research, is that you can often um, co-author with your subjects. So there's this is very controversial in more traditional sociology circles. I think it's really important because I'm also a feminist sociologist. So feminist sociology and um, feminist research in general say that the participants are part of the project. So it's not just you creating this knowledge. It's also the participants creating this knowledge. So it's really important to acknowledge their part in it and to say, hey, do you want, you know, second authorship on this book or do you want to be co-authors with me? Things like that. So these are two classic examples of participant observation versus ethnography. And we'll, we will have some readings this week about both of these things, um, participant observation, grounded theory, all this stuff. So hopefully those should clear up any other questions.